I'm Linda Baker, the Learning Director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. On behalf of the Learning Network and Knowledge Hub teams, welcome to the first webinar of our 2022-23 lineup, Indigenous Perspectives of Healing from PTSD. I'm pleased to announce that this year's Learning Network and Knowledge Hub webinars will be available in English and French. Today's speaker is presenting in English. Please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to access the simultaneous interpretation in French. I'm located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandaran peoples. These lands are connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant wampum. Wherever you are located today, please think about the traditional lands you are situated on and join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands. This webinar series focuses on gender-based violence, trauma, and healing and wellness. It is essential that this work centers the historical and current injustices that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples endure in Canada, and in particular, the violence experienced by missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit individuals. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker. Patricia Vickers is an Indigenous consultant and facilitator focusing services to Indigenous nations in British Columbia. And you can see a more fulsome brief bio on our website, and I encourage you to read that at your leisure. Patricia Vickers received her interdisciplinary Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Victoria. Following cultural protocol, she returned to her home village of Giacatla on Dolphin Island, where five fluent speakers of the Somalia language affirmed the manuscript. She is of British ancestry on her mother's side and First Nations on her father's side a mother of four and grandmother to nine, and the daughter and granddaughter of the Indian residential school system. She values ancestral teachings and the mystery in healing. Patricia, we are so pleased to welcome you. Thank you so much. Um, just a little more about my lineage. So my mother was a, a woman of British ancestry and she went to Gitkatla, which is uh, a part of the Tsimsian nation uh, with the common language being some Aliyah. She went there, uh, she was trained as a missionary, but went, was hired as a, a federal day school teacher and uh, met my father. My father's and married and my father's mother is from Gitkatla. She was Kathleen Collinson. Her father was from Haida Gwaii. And my father's father was from Bella Bella, which is a healthy Hiltzit nation. I want to speak a little to um, neurofeedback and how I came about focusing on healing from healing PTSD. So um, it was mentioned that my father was an Indian residential school survivor, as was his mother. So I was raised with violence and alcoholism and incest. And um, I discovered in um, the, uh, it was about 2006 that I had dissociative amnesia because I went for counseling with a family member who disclosed information that I couldn't recall. Um, this set me out on a healing journey, uh, looking at 
two colleagues, Ulrich Lanius and uh, Steve Milstein, who I'd worked with in, in uh, Port Hardy with the Guasala and Nakwata people. And um, they said lens would help me to recover that which I didn't have access to in my brain. So um, what an amazing journey it's been, I've been on in learning more about the brain and how magnificent it is. Um, so before I begin these slides, I'd like to do an uh, orienting with you. It comes from psychiatrist Frank Corrigan in the UK. So taking time to notice your breath. And if you're comfortable closing your eyes, feeling yourself held by gravity in your chair, held by gravity in your chair. And now in your head, between the back of your head and the inside of your closed eyelids, seeing the wall directly behind you. And about how far you would have to reach or move to touch that wall. And then moving clockwise, going to your left and seeing that wall in your head. Maybe some of the things that are against her in that, are on that wall. Perhaps there's a door that you came in and will go out. And straight in front of you, about how far would you have to move to touch that wall? And lastly, the wall to your right. This is the fourth wall in the room that you're seated in. The orientation process, uh, you can open your eyes now, that completes orienting. And um, if you're in a family of hunters, you know that being oriented is very important or if any of you have done um, where you use a topographical map and a compass orienteering, then um, you know how it's important to see where you are so you know where you can move to. So this is also for the brain to when you're triggered to orient yourself into the here and now rather than existing in the past. So this slide is to um, say that I will be covering some information that could be disturbing, especially in speaking to Indian residential schools and the atrocities that happened there. And by being attendee, it's your consent to participate and to listen and to observe. This slide is about the Niska and Tsimtsian chiefs. Um, this was interpreted from the Somaliach language to English by interpreter Charles Barton in 1887 when they traveled to Victoria to meet with the then governor. And so at one point in their conversation, one of the chiefs said, You can keep a bird in a cage. But even if the cage is beautiful, the bird will never be free. What else is significant about this is that they could see that it is about a domination energy rather than a mutual respect energy. 
They could see it because they knew oppression. Uh, it existed in, in our societies before colonization. When I was a doctoral student, I was introduced to uh, Paulo Freire, and um, I think his work is timeless. It's significant work uh, from this book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So this is one of the quotes. Dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also, though in a different way, those who have stolen it is a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. Beautifully said. And how this works with our ancestral teachings is that we're all human beings first. And we need to acknowledge that we're all human beings first. And that when one human being or a group of human beings chooses to act unjustly towards another repeatedly, for example, in Canada over 400 years, then we're looking at oppression. And what he's saying is that both the oppressor and the oppressed are stuck in this value system. This then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed, to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. The oppressors who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. Uh, uh, definitely a critical key and one that we look at and see in, in um, when we examine what is freedom. Then freedom, if we're looking at our, our ancestral principles, is about peace and respect. So within oppression and the system of oppression, we don't have respect and there is not peace. But almost always during the initial stage of the struggle, the oppressed, instead of striving for liberation, tend themselves to become oppressors or sub-oppressors. The very structure of their thought has been conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete existential situation by which they were shaped. Their ideal is to be men or women, but for them to be men is to be oppressors. This is their model of humanity. We see this in our communities today, and I, I can give you an example. One, one phrase that's used is um, crabs in the bucket. So when one Indigenous person is doing well, is um, what we would say succeeding and uh, different from others who are, tend to be more dependent, uh, they're looked at as a threat. So I can give an example for myself when I completed the master's degree, I thought that, and this was unconscious, I thought I was superior because I had a master's degree. And I was working in the treatment center called Wilpsaset. It means house of cleansing in, in Gedwingach. There were two women therapists, one was Gwen, the other Yvonne. 
they were older than me and neither of them had graduated from high school. They were incredibly compassionate and they had life experiences, their education. I couldn't see this because I valued my schooling more than their education. And when I finally awoke to my conditioning as an academic, it was during a game. And the game was that a person was to pretend that they were a cat and they'd go around and they do things that cats do, rub on your leg or look at you and meow. And if you laughed, then you had to be the cat. And um, I noticed that they could play this game and they were completely themselves. And I was rigid. And then I, that's when I saw that, wow, I believe that I was superior to them and I was shocked at my belief. So um, not thinking about what telling them would mean, I sat down with them and I told them about how I'd been conditioned and what I thought. They, of course, were hurt by it. Why? Because they believed they were inferior. Because that's our condition as, conditioning as Indigenous people. The central problem is this, how can the oppressed as divided, unauthentic beings participate in developing the pedagogy of their liberation? Only as they discover themselves to be hosts of the oppressor, can they contribute to the midwifery of their liberating pedagogy. As long as they live in the duality in which to be is to be like, and to be like is to be like the oppressor, this contribution is impossible. The pedagogy of the oppressed is an instrument for their critical discovery that both they and their oppressors are manifestations of dehumanization. I'm so grateful for books, for writing, for people recording their learnings when it can support transformation from oppression to freedom. I think what's significant in what Freire says comes back to both the oppressor and the oppressed are caught are imprisoned or uh, being from the Northwest Coast are in the same canoe. And so freedom comes first from recognizing the symptoms and how all of this works over and over again. So for myself, I believed I was superior because I had a master's degree. And then I came to see that I was not superior. But I'm, I would say it's taking time to, um, I wouldn't say uncondition, but to face the conditioning and to choose not to see white people as inferior or people who haven't graduated as inferior or alcoholics or those struggling with addiction, whatever the other may be. So the thing about what Ferrari is saying that's congruent with our ancestral principles is that first we must look at a problem from the understanding, we can say belief, that we're all humans first. And we move from that place, or sometimes in ceremony in some traditions in the sweat lodge, they'll say two leggeds. We must see ourselves as two leggeds first.
So moving on and looking at oppression and the nature of oppression uh, between 2007 and 2015, the government of Canada provided about 72 million to support the truth and reconciliations work. The TRC spent six years traveling to all parts of Canada and heard from more than 6,500 witnesses. And then what I say is there are those who chose to remain silent. They weren't a part of the 6,500. Those who died at an early age before 2007, maybe they were drinking and driving, or maybe they committed suicide by hanging or by shooting themselves in the head. And those who were killed as children who are being found in unmarked graves. Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their homes by the RCMP. 150,000 Indigenous children were taken from their families. 90 to 100 percent suffered severe physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. There was a 40 to 60 percent mortality rate in Indian residential schools. Residential schools date back to the 1870s. Over 130 Residential schools were located across Canada. And the last school closed as recently as 1996. Two thirds of Canadians believe, and four in 10 strongly believe, that Canadians with no experience in res Indian residential schools have a role to play in reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and all Canadians. I think that still we're seeing that there isn't the knowledge of the atrocities that ha happened in Indian residential schools. You must read some of the transcripts or the, um, the volumes of books that were published from the uh, Truth and Reconciliation. One of the clients I had was raped by the bus driver, the principal and the priest. And she said there was a room in the basement of the school that had a single bed where children were restrained. So that's one tiny glimpse into the horrors and what it must have been to go to sleep at night or if they could sleep the dangers that were there on a daily basis during the day with physical abuse and then in the evenings with sexual abuse. So looking at this intergenerationally, I understand um, not only because my father was a pedophile, but also looking at his mother and how this violence and dehumanization went from generation to generation to generation. So I think at this point, it's important to look at when there's such incredible darkness and hell. 
how, how is it that, well, that I'm here speaking to you with clarity, uh, without blame, without judgment, without criticism, but simply with facts. The Gitsan people, I was living in Gitsan territory, and that's up the Skeena River from Prince Rupert. So you go up the Nass River to the Niska people, and they speak some Aliyah. And then you travel up the Skeena River to the Gitsan people, who also speak a dialect of some Aliyah. And I'm from the coast, from a village southwest of Prince Rupert. So my knowledge of the feast hall and of ancestral law in Gitsan territory, it's referred to as a yoke. In Niska territory, it's a yuke. And in Tsimtsian, it's a yao. So from ancestral law, we see that there are four tribes. And from Gitkatla, the village I'm from, it's the eagle, the killer whale, the raven, and the wolf. And then each house or web has a chief, a matriarch, princes and princesses who are in line for leadership, a headman or nobleman, and the speaker for the chief. That's within a house. And so in a padek or a tribe, you can have several houses of eagles or several of killer whales or ravens or wolves. So the adawah are the sacred stories of Tzimtzian people. And they give account of the encounters with the supernatural beings. And also the Adao give account of supernatural beings and where they were encountered. And the Adao connect us to the land and to the spirit world. So then if we look, we have this interconnectedness of humans to the land, to the supernatural spirit world. So there's this interconnectedness. And our feasts are about passing on information. They're uh, legal transactions that happen. So when two people are married, they're bringing together two different tribes or two different nations, Haida Tsimtsian. And so this is all recorded and acknowledged formally. If you're invited to a feast, then you'll be paid money to be there because you're a witness to the transactions that transpire. There's also memorial feasts. When someone dies, their name is passed on to someone else. So the name goes on from one generation to the next to the next. My name from Gitkatla is Dzokom So how I live holding that name is important. It's important because it was given to me to hold for as long as I live. And then it will be passed on to someone else to hold. So it's a powerful, powerful way of living and being that I was brought into by uh, Gitsan women. One was a chief by Smith, another a fluent speaker. Jane Smith, they came up on either side of me after I found out my father had sexually abused my daughters. They came up on either side of me and they said, you must come to the feast. 
you must take the language. And then I could see how, how this was the incredible resource that helped not only me to survive, but all those who were before me to survive the atrocities. So how does this, what does it look like in action? There was a feast on Haida Gwaii that I was invited to by uh, by Reg Davidson. And um, I got to witness what a making it right or a cleansing feast looked like. So that's something huge because the offense was one where a person lost part of their leg. So, and um, everyone in the community knew about it. So a feast brings everyone together again to make it right. Um, there, are all, there are also other ways to do this. And for example, I was called in by a school district to work with a situation to resolve a situation where six youths or children actually, um, the eldest was 13, had broken into the school and they'd vandalized the elementary school. So B is the six uh, children and then A, the uh, victim in this case was the school. And this act impacts everybody, not just the school, but the community. So, um, and I think in a, in a world where we live as individuals, we tend not to see that we're all connected. So what I was asked to do was to help to bring some results. So the first thing, uh, for B, you can see gathering information regarding the nature of the offense. So what was the damage? How much did it cost? Who was involved? And then what will compensation look like? And then A, the impact on the individual. In this case, it was a building, um, but Definitely the principal and the teachers were impacted by the um, vandalism. And then what is needed for healing? So what I did was I asked for uh, four chiefs to come together and I asked them how they would resolve this conflict following their ayaw. And so the first thing these four hereditary chiefs did was they identified all of the children and the father's side, which is one tribe, and the mother's side, which is another tribe. So they identified the tribes of all seven. And the thing that's important here is that it was over, uh, a wide a geographical span involving four communities. So that's a lot of knowledge that the chiefs hold within their head. It's not written down, it's not on computers. They knew. So the chiefs have a knowledge of who you are and what tribe you belong to. And then the next step was to um, once they learned that, that it was $1,700 worth of damage, then they said the next step is for the father's side of the children to be informed. And the father's side was, the father was to meet with the principal so that they could learn of the extent of the damage. So um, I went and I delivered a letter to the homes of the six children um, to save time. Otherwise, it would have been someone, a speaker for the, for the um, victim A. 
but in this case, it was a school and the school didn't belong to a tribe. So what the four chiefs advised was that there be a chief that sits with the principal to, to represent a tribal, a tribal meeting. So, um, so the fathers of all six children, all of them showed up. And one by one, they met with the principal, our CMP officer was there, and they heard what the damages were, what was done, and agreed. Actually, they volunteered to commit to paying the, for the costs of the repairs. The next step would have been for, for there to be food and a gathering in the school with teachers and with all the students. And for each one of those children with their father's side to speak to what they'd done, that it was wrong and that they were sorry. This feast would be the making it right feast. It would be wiping away everything that they'd done. And it was once it's been cleansed and been through a cleansing feast, we're not to hold that against that person any longer or to let it go. For my father, I went back to Gitkatla and I met with my father was killer whale. My mother was adopted because she was an English woman. She was adopted by the eagles in Gitkatla by Simoa Gitkilaskamach. So I went as an eagle to sit at the killer whale table. So I had to be given permission to speak because my father asked me to speak on his behalf. So I met with the killer whale chiefs and I I said, my father has done wrong and he would like to make it right. This was the initial and the only meeting that happened. Uh, it was the beginning of my learning that it's uh, sometimes depending on the nature of the offense, it takes time to resolve the anguish, to resolve the wrongdoing, and to see that we have within our communities, a, uh, the intergenerational trauma means, I'm an example of it, that we have parents or grandparents who sexually abuse their own relatives. I would say this is the darkest and most frightening for our people to face. So I done uh, lens neurofeedback with Ulrich Lanius and um, Steve Nolstein and recovered a, a lot of uh, memory through neurofeedback, which was utterly amazing. And I finally made sense to myself why I had so much rage. Um, up until that point, I was so ashamed and felt so much guilt about the rage I had as a mother. It was horrible. And so going through the neurofeedback sessions, it wasn't that I excused or ex I excuse my um, behavior as a mother. It's that I understood myself and I finally could have compassion for myself. So this uh, it is, uh, you can find this on, a, on YouTube a video of uh, Bessel speaking to how the brain has changed. So number one, the threat perception system is enhanced. People see danger where other people see something that can be managed and the body system becomes fear-driven. Number two, the filtering system, I love how he says, gets messed up. You start paying attention to things that are not relevant to the bigger picture or hypervigilance, and it becomes difficult to engage in everyday, ordinary situations. 
And number three, the self-sensing system gets blunt, which is a defensive response to terror, neglect, abuse, which leads to habitual behaviors that dampen or numb the sensing system. So when I heard him go over these three, I thought, this is really good news. This is really good news. Because if trauma can change the brain, then the feast hall, our ancestral principles, our cleansing ways can help to heal the brain. And then there's, of course, neuroscience, neurofeedback and deep brain reorienting. So making it right for myself and making it right for all. So if I make it right for myself, then I make it right for all. And I can say that to make it right for myself has meant that I've been able to find ways, methods to help me to come out of dissociative amnesia, to to be able to heal from the atrocities that I suffered as a child, and that I can make sense to myself. So when I spoke to the Gitsan chief, Joan Ryan, and I said to her, it seems like the Al-Yaw is separated into two different systems. One is the protocol and process, which is our feasts, our, our uh, memorial feasts, our wedding feasts, our, our coming of age feasts. And the other is our cleansing ways. So our cleansing ways being bathing uh, on the all along the coast, bathing using uh, cedar boughs, um, moving water, we go in and we, we dip or we totally submerge and that's to let it all go, let the water take it from us. Or there are cleansing ways from the interior or the prairies, which are the sweat lodge. Um, and, and, that, and in that ceremony, we crawl into the womb of mother earth to be cleansed by heat, by the heat of rocks that become our ancestors. So when I said to her that it seems like the, there are two different systems, she immediately and with incredible force said, no, don't ever think of these as two separate ways. I, I didn't understand why she said it with such force at the time, but I do now. Because our cleansing ways are a part of our everyday life. It's how the chiefs were able to, to see that a domination in just way of living was unfolding for them and their people. They could see that because they were cleansing. And the spiritual cleansing gives us our inner vision, our ability to see. For me to see that my father did horrible, ugly things to me, and that I will never know what happened to him. He died in 2007. But I know it was horrible. It doesn't excuse him. It's simply about facts. So this final uh, bullet here is one heart 
one mind. And it, um, it's said in the feast halls, um, and to say it in some aliyah is sakait kulam kot, one heart, one mind. So when, when I am aligned with my cleansed heart, then that inner seeing, that spiritual seeing is connected with my thinking. And when we're all in this place where we are thinking from our mind and our heart, then we're all unified as one heart and one mind. So I'm going to end it here. That's the last slide. And I'm open for the next stage, which I believe is Q&A. It is, Patricia. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I think it's a perfect time to switch to uh, questions and answers, which people certainly have. I wanted to start, and my colleague, Annalise Stratman is going to ask, uh, take, we're going to take turns so that we make sure that we um, move through questions in the most um, equitable way and timely way. But I wanted to start with this one. One of our participants um, had a question for you and wanted to hear you speak more when you said individuals chose to stay quiet when there was an opportunity um, or an invitation for people to share their experiences in terms of residential schools, um, that some people chose to stay quiet. And the question was, is it really a choice? If you are an Indigenous person and were impacted directly and or intergenerationally by the various traumas, and you are at the early stages of healing, wouldn't the shame, fear, and self-doubt keep you quiet? And if so, is that really a choice to be quiet? Right, what a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to the TRC, what was happening was, um, survivors were connecting with each other so they weren't alone and they were making this and they do that so well I, I work with um, people who are in their 80s 70s and 80s and have been to Indian residential school and they have a connection that stays with them so um, I, I would say definitely in the case that I was speaking to, they were choosing not to. Thank you. But I, I would say um, for, for myself, um, I started looking in my teens for help. Um, and I, I was asking, I went to church, so I was asking clergy but I would only step around the outside. I wouldn't speak directly to what I needed help with. And I could tell by, by being around the outside, they didn't have what I needed. So I would like to say that there are still few who can work with our people. And the, um, the extent of change that's happened in the brain so the beauty that I find in neuroscience and how it's different to mental health is that I can say to Ruth Lanius, um, I'm, I'm at this real state of dysregulation and she can put me in touch with somebody, uh, Cindy Shrigley actually, who knows about the, the brain and, and about trauma and can help me to to come back to regulating, but not only that, to integrate what I'd experienced. Very, very few professionals in Canada who can work with that. So in that sense, I would say, yes, I agree. And this is the problem, is that we don't have the therapists who are trained in a way that we need them to be. 
it's not only ceremony we need, we also need neuroscience. And, and what's so inspiring about your talk today, you're seeing those two things, ceremony and neuroscience as compatible. That's right. That's right. Because they are, you know. And uh, uh, I completed a study on Haida Gwaii, a neurofeedback study, um, really tremendous commitment by the Haida people to participate. And um, what we found was in uh, really encouraging results. So, you know, how, how can we approach this in a way that is going to help all that's 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 what I'm most interested in is is um, how to do that. Thank you, Patricia. Annalie. Thanks, Linda. Uh, thank you so much for your talk today, Patricia. It, um, it was so interesting and um, so insightful. One of the, uh, so following up on what we were just talking about there, could you talk a little bit, somebody wants to know, can you talk a little bit about the neurofeedback process and what kind of um, treatment or therapy are you using? Are you using EDMR or are you using something else? Yeah, I don't use EMDR. I, I use DBR, so deep brain reorienting. I went through, um, I went through training with Frank Corrigan and the orienting works incredibly well with our, our cultural way, um, simply because uh, we're oriented to where we're from. You know, I, I spoke, I'm from the village of Kitkatla and where it is geographically, and then where Gitsan people are geographically. So um, that orienting is a really uh, important part. One of the things that and, uh, just just a sec, I think there was also the question about how does neurofeedback work? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I went through was lens low energy um, neurofeedback system. So what lens does is it emits a, a frequency less than your cell phone to uh, specific regions of the brain. So the EEG sensor is, is moved to these different um, parts of the brain, which is gradually increased. And the reason it does, and it's primarily for dissociative amnesia. And um, the reason it does that is because the brain has its, has its um, firings that will get the same blocking result. So what uh, lens does is it interrupts that functioning of the brain mm -hmm. so that there's this little opening and I can gain some, this little piece of memory. And then as I relax with this process and the mind accepts because it's the brain and mind working together, then um, as the uh, lens is continued, then more, more memory. So that's just one um, neurofeedback system. And the one that I used on Haida Gwaii was uh, with mind lift and the Muse 2 head bent and an EEG sensor placed on PZ. And that was simply to work towards training the brain to alpha state, so to relax. That's all it did, just the one uh, protocol no energy going into the brain. It was simply um, recording the brain waves. So you'd have an iPad and um, through Bluetooth hooked up to the MindLift dashboard, and you would be working towards making the runner run, let's say. So when the runner is running, then that's rewarding your brain because you're in an alpha state. So um, then when the runner doesn't run, you're out of the alpha state. So your brain gets it before your mind does. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And that goes back to your words. The brain is magnificent uh, when you open the talk, uh, Patricia, yes. for sure. 
Patricia, one of the things that was uh, very moving, certainly um, for myself and obviously for many of our participants, was when you talked about making it right for self, making it right for all in the powerful words of Chief Ryan and your experience in um, dialoguing with her. And one of the, there's two, this is a two part question. The first one is, sure. can someone be focused on, because of that connectedness, can someone be focusing on making it right for all and not necessarily aware of or not ready to focus on self and is that a way to make it right with self by making it right with all or is it the case that most often people start making it right with self and then moving on and knowing they're connected and that that's the beginning of making it right for all i i think what's important here is there's a whole process to making it right so, um, and you're led through the process. So, um, so first of all, there would be teachers and elders speaking to you to find out if you understood why it was an offense and they'd help you to understand. Then they, they would help you to connect with your own emotions and what you believe about yourself and others. So it's really a, th a thorough therapeutic process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry. Um, so m making it right with myself involves me having teachers and supports. Like I said, Jane Smith was on one <laughs> side and Vi Smith was on the other, you know? And they led me into really into ancestral law. So um, what I haven't got to where I am by myself. No. And, and one of our participants wanted to know, in making it right, is there ever a situation where the community chooses not to accept it? Ah. Uh, um, I would say generally where we are as Indigenous people is we're not using this process. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that um, that's, there's knowledge of it, but we're not yet using it in the way that we can mm -hmm. to, for example, I, gave, I said my father, I went with my father back and he wanted to go through a cleansing process, which would mean he'd have, there'd have to be people there to lead him through it. And so we have in our communities um, unresolved of sexual offenses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's this uh, midden. And so it, it's a, I said it's a long process. It's a slow process of respect. It's a careful, we have a saying, hug will yan, go carefully, go slowly, go gently. So, um, yeah, I haven't heard of where communities refuse someone. It's more that um, maybe between two people, the, the, um, the one, the victim hasn't accepted the terms that the perpetrator's offering. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's um, more that than, than a community rejecting. Okay, thank you. So um, one of our participants commented that um, the Indigenous people are going through a spiritual warfare at this time. They're needing the utmost support and guidance to walk towards healing their bloodline. And so how can um, people overcome the feeling of rage and anger and start to see the human in front of them? Yeah, well, for me, it... it um, I think many of our people are living with dissociative amnesia, for one thing. I, when, because uh, in my work as a psychotherapist, I find so many of them have large gaps in their childhood where they have no, no recall. They can't access that memory. 
Um, and this is why I'm focusing on neural feedback. Because how can you, how can I, I couldn't make it right with myself because I couldn't access um, these experiences that I had throughout my childhood. I only had access to like about uh, a fifth of what actually happened. So, um, so the first step is in being able to recall the atrocities. And then when you can recall um, moving through the blame and the hatred um, and the criticism, because that's all a part of the grief work. And um, for me, ceremony has really helped me to integrate it all. Um, so we need our cleansing ceremonial ways to be able to integrate, to, to um, not for me to come to the meaning, to say this is the meaning, and you know, as academics, that's what we're trying to do. But for for me to wait for the meaning to come to me, the understanding to come to me, uh, because in ceremony we know that this is it, it happens. We get guidance. Yeah. You positioned your presentation, Patricia, with the work of Paulo Fier, and. Uh, um, one of the participants is wondering how you connect his work in education with working with an, the individual with trauma. Right. So um, thank you. I love the questions. I, I just really appreciate dialogue because I learned so much in dialogue. Um, so I took what I was reading of Freire, um, and I really didn't think about, even though he was an educator, I didn't think about it as being only for education because he says it's a human condition. So I first looked at how incest was dehumanizing, how rage is dehumanizing. And, um, and then, being able to, the Dalai Lama speaks of cyclic existence and to be able to see the cycle within it. So um, I, I don't know if that's a cultural way. <laughs> there, there are some things I don't know about uh, how I see things. I'd need fluent speakers to say, yep, you're thinking like an Indian, <laughs> uh, which is what we were called when I was young. So. Um, so I would say that I haven't compartmentalized in that way with Freire's work, that it's education. Yeah. This is psychotherapy. This is, yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, in respect to neuroscience and healing, what are your thoughts on medicating? There are so many of our children that are in care that are heavily medicated for different conditions which um, one of our participants believes comes from intergenerational trauma and PTSD that never got properly healed. Is it beneficial to be on antidepressants and antipsychotics? Um, I, I chose not to um, when I was in my mid thirties, but it sure makes it challenging, you know, to, to live with, um, severe depression um so i wouldn't be able to answer personally uh from that but i've used other behaviors to medicate and i would say there's yes there's a certain period of time where it's important to be able to have that kind of support but um for me the ideal is to um to have a good life mm -hmm. um, as, as, my, as my medicine, you know. 
So, yeah. Thank you. Patricia, we have many indigenous peoples living in urban settings. And one of the questions as the person thinks through your words on reconnection and reintegration with cleansing practices, what about when in urban indigenous people are disconnected from the land? Do you have um, suggestions for connection and healing when that disconnection from land may be present? Okay, let, let me understand the words. So reintegration. There was another re word that you used. Reconnection. So suggestions okay. about reconnection and reintegration with cleansing practices yeah, when fun. people are disconnected from the land due to their urban location. So I, I think, first of all, I'd like to address the re reintegration. Um, and we tend to look at our um, anguish, the experiences that have, have us in the realm of anguish as something that is separate or that that is um, uh, there is a connection that's happening when, when we're in a state of anguish. It's true we're in alienation and disconnection from others. But I don't want to um, ever shut out those experiences of when I was raging and seeing the horror in my children's face. I don't want to ever be disconnected from that and reconnected with the healing state that I'm in. So first of all, I wanna say that all of our life experiences are of value. So I, I want to say that first and then address the next part of the question, which is about disconnection from land. Um, because you've been raised in the city. It's, uh, I, I worked at the um, Vancouver, um, it, it no longer um, is where it was, but the uh, Aboriginal Wellness Centre. And um, I had clients who were on probation and they were coming to see me. And when I asked them where they were, one of them said, Oh, um, he, he was raised in the city, Vancouver. And he had to go in. His father was an Indian residential school survivor. And he had to go in um, because his sister, they'd been out, he'd been out bike riding with his sister. His sister fell and he knew he was going to be beaten up by his dad because his sister was hurt. So before he goes into the house, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working with him to go just slowly, step by step. He's holding on to one of the trees on the boulevard. And I say to him, slow down, slow down, slow down. Tell me, can you reconnect with that tree? Yes. Tell me what's happening. And then these tears start to come from his eyes and he says, it's helping me. I said, yeah. And there was another client who is also in the city and uh, this time a female with a younger brother and a lot of violence in the home. And where she'd take her younger brother was to the golf course because there were these um, shrubs. She called them bushes. And that's where she'd take him. Another person I asked and they said, the sky. I think it's that we don't see that we're connected to nature, even though we're in the city. Because no one's there to help us pull the emergency brake to slow down. 
yeah, I drive over Burrard Inlet, Coast Salish territory, and I just feel that ocean every time I drive over Lionsgate Bridge. Mm. Yeah. What, what a wonderful reminder that the land and nature is in cities. It, it, it is. And it's about being aware of that and realizing it. And those examples are, are wonderful um, to, to help us think about that. Mm. So um, a lot of people are appreciating how you are connecting um, culture and neuroscience and science together. <laughs> Some, and and some, somebody has a question wondering about how the importance of co-regulation in the context of community for well-being. So colonial culture and institutions are often very individualistic and downloading wellness onto individuals, when in fact, the challenges and the oppression are actually systemic. So how, how do we reconcile that? Hmm. Oh, well, this is what I love about Freire's work. Yeah. He simplifies that. How was that for you asking that question? <laughs> it's complex. When, 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 when really um, relationships, we need to simplify it. And um, to, to see that it's about domination and control. Yeah. So, and, and that we're all humans first and that colonization has been happening for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. So in other words, domination has been happening since the beginning of time. So, so I think it, for me, it's about simplifying it to see what's domination behavior, which is about disrespect and manipulation and control and um and that it's a fear-based way of living not sure if that answered the question but <laughs> for for me that helps me to to yeah be within any system that i'm in and to look and to see you first that you're another human being Patricia, one of the participants shared a, a personal example and then has a, a very specific question for you. I was abused as a child, and 13 years later, I saw one of my bystanders. I spoke with her and asked her why she stayed quiet when she knew. She told me it was because she was afraid of my abuser, who happened to be my mother. I then said to her, I was a child who had no voice. I find it the most difficult to make sense of the bystanders, not even the perpetrators, but the bystanders. Patricia, how do you make sense of the bystanders in your own healing? Well, um, thank you for that really deep question. And I, I want to say first that the mother, our, our mothers are our primary caregivers. Our life starts in our mothers. And then if we're breastfed, you know, um, that our mothers are usually the ones that tend to our needs, change our diapers, feed us. So, to have, which I have not experienced, to have my mother sexually abuse me is an incredible distortion. So it, where's the mother, you know? Where's the mother? There's no bystander to step in as a mother to rescue to give the protection. So um, I, I can, ah, that hits right in the center of my breast, right into my heart. 
So um, that's, that's an incredible healing journey she's on um, to be able to uh, know that when the bystanders are also children, it's, uh, they don't have the maturity to step in and be the, be the mother. Be the father, you know, my younger brother saw what was happening to me and he didn't tell, you know, well, I understand why. It's one hell of a distortion to be living in when you're living in a house with incest. It's a huge distortion and it is hell. So... If there was a case, Patricia, where it's not a child bystander, but an adult bystander, another adult who's living in a perhaps multi-generational family um, situation, any comment in terms of coming to terms with the fact that somebody knew and, and said nothing either to yourself or to someone else to help yeah. you? I, I would say that was my mother, my mother. Mm. And um, that what I've learned is that she was one of eight girls, that um, punishment was really harsh. I think perhaps there was also incest. Um, but none of the girls ever spoke to it. My aunts never spoke to it. Um, so it, it, I, I think it's really difficult, but eventually on the healing journey, you come to see that the distortion is so incredibly broad. And, and by this reality is, it is not the truth. I mean, not the truth in the sense that I have value, my mother has value, my father has value, everyone's devalued. Thank you. And the hole just gets darker as you go deeper into it. Yeah. So Patricia, um, one of our viewers today works with homeless young adults and um, at times um, when she's working with them, they identify as having indigenous background, but they have, what, for whatever reason, they've been disconnected um, from their heritage. And how do you, what, do you have any suggestions on the best way to approach how to get them reconnected with their heritage, with their practices and their customs for support? Yeah, um, great question. So I like to, um, before I go into a community or when I'm working with someone um, from the interior with really different uh, um, ancestral principles, I like to study what I can because now you can find information. You know, I think Linda mentioned three or four different nations in the introduction of the land where you, where you are. So you could find information on each one of those. So. Um, so I, I would say that's the first thing to do and, um, and then finding immediate relatives that have some, uh, knowledge of the culture. Um, so in Coast Salish territory here, it's, uh, in Vancouver, it's an urban setting. So finding others who are, this isn't new channel territory, that's on Vancouver Island, but finding within the friendship center um, people who are from their nation. Thank you. Patricia, you've talked passionately about the importance of um, neurofeedback in terms of there were gaps in your memory due to the trauma that you experienced. And one of the participants is wondering are all tragic experiences that are buried and forgotten worth 
resurrecting for the purpose of therapy? Hmm. Well, resurrecting would imply that the mind is at work. Sorry, say that again, Patricia. Resurrecting would, yeah. at least this is how I'm thinking of it. I'm not thinking of it as a supernatural occurrence. Right. Right. But resurrecting is the is involvement of the mind. So um, uh, for myself, I was not. Um, I knew my mind was in my best friend. So um, so, but before I go more into that, I want to say that. I could see how what I didn't know kept interfering in my life. Um, I had, I had, um, I was working as the clinical director of mental health and wellness for First Nations Health Authority, and I was impatient with the system. And I was wanting to move things, move things, move things. And it wasn't happening in the way that I thought it needed to happen. And so that's when I, uh, my nervous system couldn't handle it. The pressure I was putting on myself. But it was because I was perceiving threat. So all those three points that I went over, um, I, I was in all of them. And I knew my nervous system was crashing. So for me, I went to two colleagues that I thought could help me and they did. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think first, it's important if, if you are living life where you're happy with how you're living your life, you're at peace with how you're living your life, um, it's not interfering with your, uh, your work or your everyday relationships. Um, for me, it was interfering. Yeah. And so I knew I, I needed to get help. So I think that's a, a really important, um, at least for me, a really important place for us to, to end on that it if it's interfering and you feel it's interfering, then that's that's sort of a powerful message that you want to um, begin a journey such as the one that you're describing. However, there may be a situation where the, the, the suppression or repression of that memory does not appear to be interfering. And that may be a healthy coping mechanism that somebody may, in terms of surviving that very difficult experience um, has de been developed, not consciously necessarily, but yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. I am sorry that we have to bring this to a close. This discussion has been so rich, Patricia, and a wonderful way um, for Anna Lee and I to um, um, share some of the amazing comments and questions that our participants had um, following your inspiring and, and very personal uh, presentation. We'd also like to thank Jessica and Christy from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service and Wendy and Caroline for the French interpretation. At this point, we'd also like to remind you to make use of and share the resources sent to you this morning along with the PowerPoint presentation of Patricia's and that was also um, shared in the chat box. We hope you'll join us on June 21 for the next Learning Network and Knowledge Hub webinar, Unraveling the Complexities of Domestic Violence and Criminalization in Black Women's Lives by Patrina Duhaney. Patricia, again, thank you so much. And we just want everybody to be well and safe and hope to see you at the next webinar. Mm -hmm. Bye.
Thank you all. Bye-bye.